Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. The New World Order is a term used by Christians to describe the coming world government that's laid out in the Bible. This government comes to fruition in the seven-year tribulation that follows the rapture, which, of course, is the removal of Christians from earth. If we're living in the time right before the rapture, we should see this government beginning to come together. Brandon House pulls no punches as he clearly ties the events of today with the Bible's Latter-day prophecies. Enjoy Unmasking the New World Order by Brandon House. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be with you guys in Denver. I'm in uh, Kyerville, Tennessee, just outside of Memphis, and I have an earphone in so I can hear you. I may not be able to see you, but I can hear you. And if you uh, are in agreement with some of the things I'm saying tonight and you want to applaud or say amen, I will hear that since I can't see you and I know we're tracking on the same page. I want to thank Bill for having me speak. That was a long time ago. Bill and I were talking and we started Worldview Weekends in January of 1993. And yes, we've pretty much stayed in the, in the Midwest and on the East Coast and in the South and uh, I was telling my wife yesterday, I said, there's no reason for us to go to Denver and California and Idaho. Bill has that area covered. So um, it's great that we're working together like we are. We're so thankful for Bill's ministry and my good friend Mike Gendron and his lovely wife that are there with you, our dear, dear friends of ours. And I know we're going to have a great time tonight. Well, my time is limited, so I must rush on and get right to the topic at hand. I want to speak tonight on the topic of the components of the religious Trojan horse. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. This is going to be our main text for tonight. Acts chapter 20, starting at verse 28. Acts chapter 20, starting at verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So first, we're taking heed to ourselves and then the flock. And then it goes on to say in verse 29, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things. That verse correctly translated, perverse, means twisted or distorted things. Twisted or distorted things. For what purpose? To draw away the disciples after themselves. Verse 31, therefore watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is so much of what is the religious Trojan horse. Men who have risen from within to distort and twist the scriptures to draw away the disciples after themselves. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. For it warns us again of this religious Trojan horse in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, which says, But there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them. So they're bringing in secretly these destructive heresies. Turn over to Jude. Jude, we see this in verse 3. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. This is in the context of false teaching. Why do we have to contend earnestly for the faith? It says right there. This is, by the way, Contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Verse 4, why? For certain men have crept in unnoticed. How have they crept in? Unnoticed. We saw a while ago they've crept in with secret heresies. We saw a while ago in Acts 20 they've risen from within. So this is very deceptive. And it says these are men who have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see in Acts 20 and 2 Peter 2, 1 and Jude that uh, this religious Trojan horse is something that we are to take notice of. The Bible tells us in Romans 16, 17, we're to mark those who are contrary to doctrine and to avoid them. So this religious Trojan horse is very serious and it is something the scriptures warn about over and over again. This is uh, a quote by the late Vance Havner. 
I love this quote by Vance Havner, who I got to hear speak when I was about six years old. Uh, and I'm so glad my parents took me to hear him. He said, the devil's not fighting religion. He's too smart for that. He's producing a counterfeit Christianity so much like the real thing that good Christians are afraid to speak out against it. And indeed, that's exactly what's happening today. And many are afraid to speak out against this false religion, this religious Trojan horse, this counterfeit Christianity that the devil's building for his own gain. Again, we've looked at Acts 20 and Jude 3 and 2 Peter. So that is our text for tonight. Now, I want to deal with the components of the religious Trojan horse. The first component we're going to deal with is the Hegelian dialectic process. I'm, I'm venturing to guess my friend of more than 20 years, John Leffler, who spoke to you earlier today, uh, spoke to you about the Hegelian dialectic process, or has in the past, in German higher criticism. And I've known John for over 20 years, and he and I have both been trying to warn the church of, of what is coming. And one of those things is to understand the Hegelian dialectic process process. Fabian socialist Julian Huxley said this years ago. He said, at the moment, two opposing philosophies of life confront each other. You may categorize the two philosophies as two supernationalisms, or as individualism versus collectivism, or as capitalism versus communism, or as Christianity versus Marxism. Can these opposites be reconciled? This antithesis be resolved in a higher synthesis? In other words, can opposites collide, conflict, and then synthesize together as a mixture of both for a third option? Antithesis, thesis, they conf conflict, they synthesize, they merge, they produce a third option or what is now called the third way. Julian Huxley, a Fabian socialist, said, I believe not only that this can happen, but through the dialect of evolution, it must happen. And that's exactly what we see today. Part of this religious Trojan horse is to deliberately make opposites collide on purpose, not only in the culture, not only in the area of the economy, socialism, capitalism, fighting, coming a mixture of both, the third way, or communitarianism, as it's also called. But this is going on in the church. Bring the unbeliever into the church. Bring the goats into the church and conflict between the believer and the unbeliever for a synthesis of a now a new form of Christianity, as Vance Havner warned about so many years ago. So we have the Hegelian dialectic process as one of the components. The other one is Fabian socialism, which I've already alluded to in quoting Julian Huxley. Fabian socialism is the mixture of capitalism with socialism with the endgame goal being globalism. It's so important to realize that a Fabian socialist wants socialism by evolution, not revolution. The man who we have in the White House today is a neo-Marxist, without a doubt, I believe. And I believe many of his um, uh, friends, like Bill Ayers, want an outright revolution. But a, neo, uh, but a, uh, a Fabian socialist or a communitarian, as they're also called, doesn't want revolution. They want a revolution by not guns, not by violence. They want a revolution by evolution. So a Fabian socialist wants a revolution over time, revolution by socialism over time, evolution. And the Fabian socialists have been around since the late 1800s. George Bernard Shaw, the quote here, a, fa a famous Fabian socialist, said, what is the use of writing plays? What is the use of writing anything if there's not a will which finally molds chaos itself into a race of gods? That's the same lie from Genesis 3, where Satan said to Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent, you will be like gods. Fabian socialism is really a religious world view, as you will see in a minute. Fabian socialist H.G. Wells years ago said, this is my religion. What's his religion? Well, it's Fabian socialism, the way of salvation. The political work of the open conspiracy must weaken, efface, incorporate, or supersede existing governments. The character of the open conspiracy will now be plainly displayed. It will be a world religion. Did you catch that, folks? Fabian socialism will be a world religion. This is part of that religious Trojan horse. I don't know how many of you have seen the Fabian window, but look at this PowerPoint slide here of the Fabian window created by George Bernard Shaw in 1910. George Bernard Shaw created this, a Fabian socialist, in 1910. At the very top of the slide, it says, remold it near to the heart's desire. Remold what? Remold the earth. Notice the globe is on an anvil. It's red hot. It has just come out of a fire behind the man in the red coat. 
And the man in the green coat is having to hold it with a pair of tongs because it's red hot, having just come out of this fire. I believe this represents some kind of crisis, more than likely a manufactured crisis, a deliberate financial economic crisis. As one man wrote years ago, a globalist, he said that the American people will not let us go where we want to go without a stupendous national crisis. So this is some kind of crisis, I believe. The, the earth is hot, it's on fire, and now it can be remolded near to the heart's desire. Notice below at the bottom, these Fabian window are nine characters kneeling and bowing in prayer at, to Fabian books and Fabian essays. Uh, at the bottom, one man is standing up and clapping, and he's said to be George Bernard Shaw, mocking the other Fabian socialist who wanted this to be a secret conspiracy. He said, no, we should make it open. Everybody should know about this. There's a little window there, or below the man in the red coat, there's a little, little triangle. And that little triangle has words in it. It might be hard for you to read, but it says, hammer stoutly, pray devoutly. Hammer stoutly, pray devoutly. Look at the religious references here. They're kneeling. They're praying to their own books. They're talking about praying devoutly, but hammering stoutly, all for the purpose of remolding the earth. But notice the logo above the hot globe. Notice that logo before, just above the hot globe. What is that? That, my friends, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. That is their own logo. A wolf in sheep's clothing. F.S. Fabian Society. They know exactly what they're doing. Whether it's a religious Trojan horse or a wolf in sheep's clothing, my friends, they realize the need for religion as the vehicle to accomplish the one world economy, their one world government. The Bible tells us there will be a one world religion. The Bible tells us there'll be a one world economy. The Bible tells us there'll be a one world government. And the Bible tells us there'll be a one world leader who shows up on the scene to run it all. And I believe it's being laid out right now. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, as you see on the PowerPoint there, said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. What fruits? Their good deeds? No, the fruits of their doctrine. Who do they say that Christ is? The, the, uh, the, what, is what is their gospel? Is that another Jesus? Is it another gospel? Do they preach the exclusivity of Christ, salvation through Christ alone, John Tells us that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we'll know them by their doctrinal fruit. Here is Tony Blair standing in front of the Fabian window. You see, the Fabian window went missing for a while. It was stolen in about 1978. It showed up uh, just a few years ago, in fact, at an auction at Sotheby's and was put on display just, I think it was 2009. And Tony Blair was there for the unveiling of this Fabian window. Look at what Tony Blair said. He said, despite all the very obvious difference in policy and attitude and positioning, a lot of the values that the Fabians and George Bernard Shaw stood for would be recognizable at least, I hope they would, in today's Labor Party. My friends, what you need to understand is that the Labor Party, of which uh, uh, Tony Blair was part of, was birthed out of the Fabian Socialist Society. Jo uh, Tony Blair is a Fabian Socialist. November 26, 2010, Telegraph says, Mr. Blair, who converted to Roman Catholicism after he stepped down as prime minister in 2007, was to address the question, is religion a force for good or ill? Mr. Blair said, I think the place of faith in the era of globalization is the single biggest issue of the 21st century. My friends, let's make no mistake where this guy comes from in his worldview. And yet this past October, less than a year now, 75 miles northeast of where I'm sitting right now in Jackson, Tennessee, is Union University. Union University is hailed as being one of the premier biblical worldview universities you can send your kids to as a Southern Baptist university. And who did they have as their keynote speaker last October? None other than Tony Blair. Who did they brag in their press release that they've had it before? Barbara Bush as well as Miguel Gorbachev. My friends, do you not see a religious Trojan horse when what is supposed to be one of the most conservative and a biblical worldview university of the Southern Baptist is bringing in Fabian socialist Tony Blair to speak? Look at what Rick Warren has said, because Rick Warren has served on the advisory board of the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. Did you hear what I just said? 
Tony Blair has a foundation that seeks to bring the religions of the world together as one, including Muslims. Go read his Tony Blair Faith Foundation website. And Rick Warren, quote, America's pastor, in quote, sits on the advisory board. He said, I honestly don't know of anyone better suited for this challenge. It's why I agreed to serve on the advisory board. The Tony Blair Faith Foundation's potential for doing good is staggering. Interesting to note that in his book, Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren quotes no less than three Fabian socialists positively. George Bernard Shaw, Aldous Huxley, and Bertrand Russell. Rick Warren, by the way, is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Along with Richard Land of the Southern Baptist Convention, I might add. My friend Dennis Cuddy has documented that the Council on Foreign Relations here in America was started in part by the Fabian Society. Notice what I just told you. The Council on Foreign Relations here in America, which operates in conjunction with the State Department, was started in conjunction with the help of the Fabian Socialist Society. And who works with them? None other than Rick Warren and Richard Land of the Southern Baptist. The next component of the religious Trojan horse is communitarianism. Now, we've talked about Fabian socialism. They want socialism by evolution, not revolution. They are using a religious osity, if you will, usually pagan spirituality, mysticism, Gnosticism. But there are many people who are part of this movement, but we would not call them Fabian socialists because they don't belong to the Fabian socialist society. So we call them communitarians. They agree with the same worldview, the same idea, the same outcome. But they don't belong to the Fabian Socialist Society, so we can't call them Fabian Socialists. We call them communitarians. George W. Bush was a communitarian, according to Don Eberly, who in the February 1st, 2001, Washington Post said that his boss was using communitarian philosophies. Bill Clinton was a, and is a communitarian who actually held with the Democratic Leadership Conference, held a series of meetings when he was president with Tony Blair, to train people on what they call the third way. Why third way? Socialism, capitalism, mix them together for a third option or a third way. Fabian socialism, communitarianism, third way, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. Richard Rorty has said this. We know that socialism has virtually failed everywhere it's been tried. He said what we need to do now is go to welfare state capitalism. Welfare, state, capitalism. The mixing of socialism with capitalism for what is welfare, state, capitalism, Fabian socialism, communitarianism, the third way. One of the people who's most prominent as far as being a communitarian and influencing many of our megachurch pastors is a man by the name of Peter Drucker, who you see on the cover of Business Week in 2005. Peter Drucker of the management philosophy and, ma and qu total quality management. Peter Drucker is now deceased, but in December of 2002 in Business Week, Business Week recorded, reported, quote, he, meaning Drucker, brings a communitarian philosophy to his consulting. Look, this is not Brandon House calling him a communitarian or saying he embraces a communitarian philosophy. This is Business Week <coughs> calling him a communitarian. Here we have a report by the Peter Drucker Foundation and the Rockefellers. By the way, don't forget the Rockefellers helped start the Council on Foreign Relations in 1921, donated the land on which the United Nations sits today, which was started in 1945. The Rockefellers have been funding many, many churches and pastors for years and church movements for years. We'll see why in a minute. But notice you have Peter Drucker and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund working together. And in 1996, their report said this. The Drucker Foundation believes that a healthy society requires three vital sectors, a public sector, a private sector, and the social sector. These three sectors, when they come together, we can literally solve the world's problems, solve man's problems, create heaven on earth, have globalism and peace and unity in the new world order and heaven on earth, dominionism. Well... Here's Peter Drucker, Forbes Magazine, 1998. He says, but a social discipline such as management deals with the behavior of people and human institutions. The social universe has no natural laws. Listen, folks, Peter Drucker's saying there's no absolute truth. There's no absolute truth, no natural laws. 
Things are evolving spiritually. We're all spiritually evolving up. As the, so there's no natural laws as the physical sciences do. The, he says, it is thus subject to continuous change. Drucker went on to say that society needs to return to spiritual values, not to offset the material, but to make it fully productive. Mankind needs the return to spiritual values, for it needs compassion. It needs the deep experience that the thou and the I are one. Pantheism. All is part of God. God is all. Pantheism. All is God. Panentheism. God is in all. Again, pantheism. All is God. Panentheism. God is in all. The thou and the I are one, which all higher religions share. Folks, Peter Drucker was not only a communitarian, but he was also a paganist. He taught himself to read Danish so he could read the writings of Soren Kierkegaard, who believed in existentialism, no absolute truth. Well, we just heard Peter Drucker say that. He also praised, as one of the greatest economists of all time, John Maynard Keynes, from which we get the term Keynesian economics. John Maynard Keynes was a Fabian socialist whose particular depravity was the molestation of little boys. Here is New York Times, November 19th, 2005. A man's spiritual journey from Kierkegaard to General Motors. Again, talks about Drucker's love of Soren Kierkegaard who believed in existentialism, subjective truth, and brought it into the church. The next component is the what I call the communitarian church growth movement. Some might call it the seeker-sensitive church movement or the church growth movement. I coined the phrase a few years ago, the communitarian church growth movement, because that's exactly what it is. It is people like Peter Drucker, Rick Warren, and others who believe that the way to solve the world's problems is not through faithful preaching of the gospel, but it is through the social sector, churches, the government, and corporations coming together in what Rick Warren and Peter Drucker referred to as the three-legged stool. So I call it the communitarian church growth movement. Here's uh, Rick Warren on the cover of Time Magazine in this PowerPoint. Rick Warren admits to being discipled by Peter Drucker. By the way, Bill Hybels of Willow Creek also admits this, as well as does another man by the name of Bob Buford, who uh, is out of Texas and started what is known as Leadership Network. We'll talk about in a minute. Rick Warren said if business and government were able to solve the world's problems by themselves, they would have done it by now. A combination of the public, private, and parish sector is needed. That's your three-legged stool. Your government, corporations, and churches coming together as equal partners. Warren has said the government has the administrative power to form agendas and set the goals. The business sector can provide the expertise, the capital, and the managerial skills. And the church can provide the distributive network and the local credibility. Here's Bob Buford. Again, Bob Buford has made comments to the effect he doesn't know where his thinking, uh, uh, where Drucker's thinking and influence on his life ends and his own begins. And P Bob Buford started the Leadership Network out of Texas, which consults churches how to become big mega churches. And they said the mission of the Leadership Network is to accelerate the emergence of the 21st century church. Notice that term emergence. How many of you are familiar with the emergent church? Well, how, how many of you know that the emergent church is credited by Brian McLaren, one of the emergent church leaders, as coming out of the leadership network? He said this new paradigm is not centered in theology. Well, that's great. Let's, let's teach churches how to grow their church but not center it in theology. Now, that does not sound like a New Testament church to me that we find in the epistles. But rather it is a structure, an organization, and the transition from an institutionally based church to a mission-driven church. My friends, what they're doing is completely repackaging the church to no longer fit with the mandates of the New Testament church, as I said, are found in the New Testament, but to be a man-centered organization for bringing about global governance, the new world order, dominionism, social justice, social gospel, the kingdom of God on earth. Dr. Robert Klink summarizes the dangers of the seeker-sensitive church model that I also refer to as the sinner-sensitive church model because we don't want to do anything to make the sinner uncomfortable like preach the gospel. He said, in this movement, it is imperative that the unbelievers are brought into the church. Otherwise, the process of continual change cannot begin. 
There must be an antithesis, unbelievers, present to oppose the thesis, believers, in order to move towards consensus. Well, how do you have consensus? You compromise and move the believers away from their moral absolutism. If all members of the church stand firm on the word of God and its final authority in all doctrine and tradition, then the church cannot and will not change. This is common faith. Soon we will see why these change agents are pushing so hard for change to occur in the church. End quote. Can I tell you, my friends, the Hegelian dialectic process, the thesis and antithesis, the believer, the unbeliever, bringing the goats into the church and saying, now we have to make them feel comfortable. We send out people who do surveys in the community and say, now what is the community looking for in the church? And then we create a church to meet those man-centered felt needs instead of the purpose of the church, which we see in, in Ephesians, which is to equip the saints for the work of ministry and then send them out to preach the gospel. Instead, we bring the world into the church and the Bible says, go ye therefore into the world. It doesn't say bring the world, therefore ye into here. And that, that's exactly what we're doing. And to make people comfortable, we set aside sin, the wrath of God, the moral law, the gospel, and we go after their felt needs with a social gospel. And in reality, what is happening is the social engineers, the globalists like Peter Drucker have written books and trained men who write books and host conferences and the nation's pastors and pastors around the world go to conferences and little do many of them know they're learning from a philosophy and a worldview that is antichrist. A philosophy and a worldview that is deliberately designed to compromise the church and to move it away from biblical theology and doctrine and turn the church from being an, an opposition to global governance and turn it toward helping to build for global governance, a religious Trojan horse. Growth church scholar and advocate wrote, the church itself will need to go through a metamorphosis in order to find its new identity in the dialect of gospel and culture. My friends, there needs to be no dialect between the gospel and the culture. That means we have to water the, down the gospel, which many do today through contextualizing the scripture, trying to make the, the scripture and the Bible and the gospel more relevant. My friends, either the gospel is relevant because the Holy Spirit reveals the sin of man to himself and, and the Holy Spirit convicts them and they realize their sinfulness and repent, or they don't. We do not need to try to make the gospel more relevant. All we need to do is faithfully preach the gospel and leave the results up to the Holy Spirit. I thank you for that, because now I know you're still there and awake. <laughs> Globalism is another component of the religious Trojan horse. And uh, John Rockefeller Jr. in this slide, who has funded so much of what we've talked about today and continues to through their foundation, said, would that I had the power to bring to your minds the vision as it unfolds before me. I see all denominational emphasis set aside. My friends, I want you to remember that right there. Setting aside all denominational emphasis. Now, it's great. I'm sure this room has got people who go to a Baptist church, Assembly of God, Evangelical Free, Bible Church, whatever it might be. And we agree on the essential Christian doctrines. Amen. But today, setting aside denominational differences means we unite up with the Church of Rome. We unite up with the Mormons. And we set aside doctrinal distinctions and who is Jesus and what is the gospel in order to establish a kingdom of God on earth. And that's what John Rockefeller is talking about. He said, I see the church molding the thought of the world as it has never done before, leading in all great movements as it should. Who's leading the way, folks? The church. This religious Trojan horse is going to lead the way for the one world economy and the one world government and prepare the way for a one world leader. He goes on to say, I see it, the church, literally establishing the kingdom of God on earth. My friends, we are not to build the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not from here, it is not of this world. We are not to build the kingdom of God on earth. There is this thought now of dominion theology that says if we just can take over the seven mountain mandate, 
if we can take over arts and education and entertainment and establish the kingdom of God on earth with kingdom values, then Christ can return. And that's nowhere in the scripture. In fact, to the contrary, things will get worse and worse, men deceiving and being deceived, and a great falling away from traditionally held biblical truths, the apostasy. We build God's kingdom, but not in this world. We build it in the spiritual realm as we faithfully preach the gospel. In 1959, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund report said this, speaking of the task of helping shape a new world order in all its dimensions, spiritual, economic, political, and social. But what was the first? Spiritual. Look at this, my friends. What you need to understand is that uh, running for president in 64 was um, Barry Goldwater. He wrote a book in 79 called With No Regrets. And in there, he warned that the globalist would use the church for global governance. Another component of the religious Trojan horse is neo-evangelicals. Neo-evangelicals would be your emergent church type who believe in postmodernism. Truth and reality are created by man, not by God. They believe in uncritical tolerance, and they believe in mysticism. Now, by the way, a while ago, I mentioned Bob Buford and the Leadership Network. What you need to understand is that they, Brian McLaren, one of the leaders of the emergent church, admitted that the emergent church came out of the leadership network. What you're also going to find very interesting is that this next group I want to talk to you about in a minute is known as the New Apostolic Reformation. It also came out of and has been promoted by the leadership network. All of these groups are, that are really heretical in their nature are coming together and there's cross-pollination and promotion. Look at this quote, Christianity Today, November 1st, 2001, Rob Bell, we're rediscovering Christianity as an Eastern religion, as a way of life. This is your neo-evangelicals, your emergent church, another component of the religious Trojan horse. Another component of the religious Trojan horse is mysticism, pagan spirituality, which certainly makes up the emergent church. By the way, Rick Warren in his book, Purpose Driven Church or Purpose Driven Life, quotes, no less than nine mystics. Look at this slide. There they are. No less than nine mystics does he quote positively, and there are the page numbers. Rick Warren. Rick Warren had these gentlemen at his church last year, Dr. Amen and Dr. Hyman and Dr. Oz, many of them who embrace mysticism and have written the forward to books on how to meet your own spirit or master guide that I believe is nothing less than a demon. Dr. Oz follows the cult of, Swede, uh, of Sw uh, uh, Emmanuel Swedenborg. Why would you bring these men into your church? The Bible clearly says we're not to do this. But hey, if this is what draws a crowd, so be it. Another component of the religious Trojan horse is the social gospel. Uh, the the, the, the neo-Marxist and the culture calls it social justice. But when it comes into the church, it's really nothing more than the social gospel. The father of social gospel is this man right here, Dr. Walter Rogenbush. He's one of the founders of the social gospel movement. And he said the only power that can make socialism succeed, if it is established, is religion. It cannot work in an irreligious country. This is the man who's the father of the social gospel movement. Rick Warren, in an interview, is quoted as this. Rick Warren pointed, pinpointed the world's problems in five main broader issues. Spiritual emptiness, egocentric leadership and corruption, extreme poverty, pandemic diseases, and illiteracy. See, these are the big problems of the world, says Rick Warren. But how does Rick want to solve these problems? Giving the gospel without compromise? No, because he'll go and speak to the Muslims, as he did a few years ago, and say, come join me in my peace plan. How can he invite Muslims to join him in his globalist peace plan? Because there's no gospel in this plan of his. The article went on to say, G Rick, quoting Rick Warren, Jesus did five things. The antidote for those five problems, he promoted reconciliation, equipped servant leaders, assisted the poor, cared for the sick, and educated the next generation. No, my friends, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God, and he sent out his disciples and preached that people should repent. And yet Rick Warren is compromising the gospel for his globalism, I believe, for his social gospel. Rick Warren, as I said, has created his global peace plan, here it is, P-E-A-C-E, -E, promote reconciliation, equip servant leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. This is really, I, I think, fits very well with much of the United Nations and ecumenical agenda. Another component of the religious Trojan horse is dominion theology, reconstructionism, and the new religious right. I call them the new religious right, by the way, to distinguish between that of my uh, 
friend who's now gone to be with the Lord, Dr. G. James Kennedy, Dr. Rogers, who I knew, who had a church right here just a few miles from where I'm sitting. These men, Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Adrian Rogers, were involved in starting the religious right in the 70s. And I believe if these men were involved today, they would not embrace the false teachers of today for political expediency, as much, must, much of our pro-family leaders are doing today. So I distinguish between the religious right of the 70s and what I call the new religious right, which is a new generation of young men who do not know, I believe, nor care about theology and doctrine and the purity of the gospel and protecting the church from the men who have risen from within. So I refer to them as the new religious right, and I believe they become one of the greatest threats to the church. Well, as I've already quoted, Jesus in John 18 tells us we are not to build his kingdom on earth, but we build it in the spiritual realm as we preach the gospel. Another component of this religious Trojan horse is what is called the new apostolic reformation. I don't know if you're familiar with the new apostolic reformation, but uh, as John MacArthur has said in a sermon October 23rd, 2011, it's not new. It's not apostolic, and it's not a reformation. It's kind of like it's kind of like grape nuts. It's not grapes, and it's not nuts. <laughs> kind of like Christian science. It's not Christian, and it's not science. But as MacArthur said, you would think that someone did leave the back door of the nut house open for those who were involved in it. Many of them being like Cindy Jacobs, and you can put in her name to a search engine and see her running around as a prophet of large of C. Peter Wagner and Rick Joyner, and we have the International House of Prayer out of Kansas City with Mike Bickle and Lou Engel, and many of these people say they've gone to heaven. Some of them say they're getting extra biblical revelation, yet the word of God is complete. It is all we need, and we're not to add to it. Uh, they believe they're raising the dead. Christianity astray, I mean, excuse me, Christianity today, <laughs> more accurately, or accurately, Christianity Astray would be a good title, I believe. But Christianity Today magazine in May had a featured story of Heidi Baker on the cover. Heidi Baker is working over in uh, overseas somewhere in Africa. And uh, sh the article was a glowing report of how scores of people are being risen from the dead. Todd Bentley, a few years ago, down in his Lakeland Revival, the young man who's tattooed and body piercing and eventually left his wife and children for another woman, married her, who's now being restored to ministry by Rick Joyner in uh, North Carolina. Uh, these guys think they're raising the dead. Rick Joyner is on video talking about how his, he has seen a, the never-ending casserole, food multiplying. And they're talking about food multiplying and raising the dead. And they believe, this new apostolic reformation does, that they are apostles and prophets. Let me tell you something, folks. The office of prophet and apostle is closed. We don't need any more prophets and apostles. We have the Holy Spirit and we have the word of God. People say, oh, well, wait a minute. Now, you, surely you don't believe that. Look, there's something that I, who goes to a Southern Baptist convention church, not because it's Southern Baptist, because my pastor preaches the word without compromise and has problems with the Southern Baptist convention in many ways like I do. That's not why I go there, because it's SBC. Let me tell you something, the Southern Baptist Convention and the Assemblies of God agree. In 2001, the Assemblies of God put out a report declaring this office is closed. By the way, it was in 1949 that the Assemblies of God kicked out the Latter Rain Movement out of their denomination in 1949. In 1949, they kicked out the Latter Rain Movement. Today, it's known as the New Apostolic Reformation. But the Assemblies of God kicked it out in 1949 as a theological cult. It was called Latter Rain Movement in the 70s and 80s. It was known as the Kansas City Prophets. Today it's known as the New Apostolic Reformation, given that name in 2001 by C. Peter Wagner. And here is uh, an article from Leadership Network. Remember me telling you Leadership Network, Bob Buford, influenced by Bob uh, uh, Peter Drucker, Brian McLaren, who says the Emergent Church came out of the Leadership Network? Well, here's a magazine from 1999 of Leadership Network with an article all by none other than C. Peter Wagner. These groups are cross-pollinating with each other to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Let me tell you something, folks. I don't believe they're building the kingdom of God on earth. What they're building is the kingdom of the Antichrist because they don't represent the Jesus of the Bible. The New Apostolic Reformation says that Jesus will come this special Jesus will come and be manifested in us. We will become sinless, raise the dead, judge the church, and establish God's kingdom. 
They believe that this Jesus will break in. And this is why they're running around having prayer rally after prayer rally after prayer rally for this Jesus to come, this special spirit that will secretly come. They believe that Jesus must come into his church before he comes for his church. My friends, this is not the Jesus of the Bible. This is a different Jesus. If you have a different Jesus, you have a different gospel. And yet the New Apostolic Reformation, C. Peter Wagner, Lou Engle, Cindy Jacobs, so many of these people are now being embraced by the biggest leaders of the new religious right. Why? Because they realized, as Business Insider said in July of 2011, this is the fastest growing movement inside Christianity that you've never heard of. This movement is growing rapidly, and particularly with our young people, through groups like the International House of Prayer. And major pro-family leaders from Focus on the Family to Jim Dobson to the American Family Association and many others that I can document and do in my book, Religious Trojan Horse, have no problem in entering into spiritual enterprises and prayer rallies with false teachers. And yet Romans 16, 17 says, mark those who are contrary to doctrine and enter into a spiritual enterprise with them for the purpose of reclaiming the culture. Is that what it says? No. It says, mark those who are contrary to doctrine and avoid them. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness or light with darkness? In fact, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 says, if you will not unite with unbelievers in spiritual enterprises, I will bless you or I will welcome you or I will have favor on you. Isn't it interesting? The religious right leaders of today are running around holding prayer rallies with the new apostolic reformation, which is another Jesus and another gospel. The word of faith leaders like Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and Paula White and Jesse Duplantis and Creflo Dollar and the late Kenneth Hagin, many of these who teach that Jesus did not come to earth as God, but he came to earth as a man, known as Arianism, A-R-I, not A-R-Y like Hitler, Arianism, A-R-I. Jesus came to earth as a man. Then he later became divine when the Holy Spirit entered him and that this was the model for a new race of man. And yet that's exactly what the New Apostolic Reformation teaches, that this Jesus will embody us and we will be a new race. They actually call it the Omega children. Well, isn't that interesting? Because the New Agers believe in an Omega children. They call it a new breed or Joel's army. My friends, they're fooling around with mysticism, Gnosticism, extra biblical revelation, contemplative prayer, but there's nothing more than transcendental meditation. This is a false gospel, a false Jesus. It is what will make up the harlot church. And who is giving them credibility? The assemblies of God kicked them out of their denomination in 49. And yet here is Lou Engel on the radio show this year of James Dobson, and Dobson has worked with him as far back as 2008. Here is Lou Engel working with some of the biggest pro-family leaders, along with Rick Joyner and many others. This slide here shows you a conference that took place at Liberty University in 2010. And if you could see the pictures, you'd see Rick Joyner, and you would see Cindy Jacobs, and you would see up there Lou Engel. Why are we uniting with people who are preaching another Jesus, another gospel? Here's a slide of the, uh, uh, David Barton speaking with Cindy Jacobs. My friends, what has happened is the final component of the religious Trojan horse, patriotic ecumenicalism. Just as John Rockefeller said, setting aside all denominational emphasis and building the kingdom of God on earth. Many of these people are committed to dominion theology, replacement theology. They believe we are Israel and we will establish the kingdom of God on earth. And then once we've taken the seven mountain mandate and we are ruling with kingdom values, then God will turn to Jesus and say, I release you to go. Yet that is not what the Bible tells us at all. You need to understand that they're holding one prayer enterprise after another. And much of this started with Governor Perry in the summer of 2011 at Reliance Stadium with some of the biggest word of faith NAR teachers and pro-family groups in America. And they give, they're giving them credibility. And why are they praying? One, that this Jesus will come secretly and man manifest himself in us. And we can do these things just as Jesus did when he walked on earth. Secondly, they're praying that they can take dominion. And thirdly, they're praying that they might bind Satan. Nowhere in the scriptures did we see that we're to bind Satan. Nowhere. In Jude, Michael the archangel did not get into a railing contest with Satan. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Our response is not to run around binding Satan. That doesn't happen to Revelation 20. Then he's released for a while and he's finally bound for eternity. Our response is found in James 4 verse 7. 
Submit yourself to the authority of God. Line up behind God. Obey him. Be in his will. And then take your stand. Submit to God and then resist the devil, which means take your stand. Where do you take your stand? Lined up behind God, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. My friends, these people are not praying for the right reason, nor are they praying to the Jesus of the Bible because they have redefined Jesus. And yet we're told in these scriptures to be weary of those who come preaching another Jesus and another gospel. And I believe whether it's the new religious right, the new apostolic reformation, the emergent church, the globalists, the Mormons, the new agers, so many of them are now uniting around a common false Jesus and a false gospel and a dominion theology that says, well, we have to work together in order to win the culture war. Let me tell you something, my friends. The culture war is lost. The reason it is is because the culture war is a symptom of the spiritual battle. What is not lost is the spiritual battle. The culture war is lost. The spiritual battle is not lost. And that's why we have spent billions of dollars on Christian activism. And I'm all for Christian activism in balance and voting and upholding righteousness and the purpose of government. But if we compromise biblical theology and the gospel for political expediency, then God is not pleased. And in fact, he says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, I will not welcome you. I will not have favor on you. The very thing these guys think they're doing with their prayer enterprises will bring God's blessing, will not bring God's blessing. It will bring God's judgment. He said so in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. So now what we see happening is this patriotic ecumenicalism, raising the flag above the cross. Look at this slide here of Glenn Beck standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial and the Black Robe Regiment. And these are pastors that literally locked arms. By his own admission, Glenn Beck has said imams, Muslim imams were there as well. This is nothing more than a patriotic ecumenicalism. Alice Bailey, the occultist, wrote that the new age would rest upon the foundation of a newly interpreted and enlightened Christianity being universal in nature. My friends, that's exactly what we see happening, a universal Christianity that appeals to man's sinful flesh. And yet we are to have a distinctive and be a particular people. My friends, what is happening today is that, as I said, churches and pastors are embracing the poison and they're bringing it back into the church. And Acts 20 tells us these men have risen from within, speaking perverse or distorted things. Second Peter 2, 1, these people have come in with secret heresies. Jude 3 says they have snuck in and they've made Christianity appealing and universal to people, just as New Ager Alice Bailey said would occur. They're taking the traditional church and they're putting in these man-centered ideas, these globalist manufactured models of Peter Drucker, and they're taking a traditional church and they're then transitioning it into a seeker-sensitive church, and then they transform it into a emergent church. You hear what I just said? They're taking churches from traditional to transitional to transformational. You start out as a traditional church, pretty soon your church changes. It's now very seeker-sensitive. The gospel's being watered down. Things are changing. Within a few years, your church has gone completely emergent. And how many of you know of churches 10 years ago that were evangelical churches, went seeker sensitive, and today they're outright emergent. They are total pagan churches. This is the model of the world that has been brought in. Why? Because we have not guarded the church from the men who have risen from within. In closing, let me say this. Barack Obama did not create the condition of the church. Barack Obama simply revealed the condition of the church. And the church today in America is largely a false church that will compromise in order to afford more flat screen televisions, more wealth, more materialism. The true church will stand for the gospel at any cost and any price because they realize what does it profit a man if he gains the world and loses his soul? I believe the greatest threat facing America today is false teachers. I'm no fan of Barack Obama. That goes without saying. But look at the choice we have. And many of us will have to hold our nose, and some will and some won't, and I'm not going to judge those who won't. But just think about the fact we even have to choose between Obama and Mitt Romney. I think the reason we're having to choose between those is because God is giving over our country in Romans 1. He gave them over. He gave them over. He gave them over. The increase of homosexuality, pagan spirituality. We have uh, vain and useless 
feudal thinkers. We have a corrupt, debased society, and we have leaders who practice against the righteous judgments of God and encourage others to do the same. The very five things in Romans 1 are happening to our nation and around the world as God is giving us over. But let me tell you something, my friends. We have to understand that in there it says they made the incorruptible God, they took the incorruptible God and made him like corruptible man. Isn't it interesting? We actually have to choose between a Marxist New Age Muslim and a New Age Mormon, a Mormon, and Mormons believe that God was a man of flesh and bone who evolved to become God. They took the incorruptible God and made him like corruptible man. Why do we have such pathetic choices? I believe largely because God is giving over our nation. But you say, House, you give me no hope. You give me no hope. No, I do, because here is the great hope. National judgment is nothing compared to eternal judgment. We should take what's happening to our culture and explain to the world what is happening and why, and that a righteous God judges sin. But the good news is, if you repent of your sins and place your faith and trust in Christ alone, you can pass from judgment into life. National judgment is nothing compared to eternal judgment. Come to Christ and flee the wrath to come. I also believe Daniel chapter 2 says that God's kingdom comes and it crushes Satan's kingdom. And of God's kingdom, there'll be no end. Make no mistake about it. Satan is on a leash. Satan is on a leash. God has him on a leash, but he's letting some slack out of that line. Satan is being allowed to build his kingdom. And what I want you to understand tonight is that the men who have crept in with their secret heresies and doctrine is a religious Trojan horse. And much of it is in the very middle of the camp of modern day evangelicalism because people have forgotten the first thing that we're to preach, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Today, they're going after power and prestige and money and acclaim. And even the biggest evangelical religious right leaders in America are giving them credibility. Let me say, and I must conclude, my friend John Leffler was told last year, if you speak for Brandon House's conference anymore, your radio show will be kicked off our radio network. That's what a radio network out of Mississippi told John Leffler. John Leffler sent them back a letter and said, I'm going to stick with truth, and I'm not throwing my friend overboard. We are seeing, we are seeing exactly what Walter Martin predicted would happen in 1983. In an ordination service for my friend, the late Ron Carlson, he said that the Christian media was already in 83 censoring the message of the gospel and that evangelicalism would continue to censor truth. Today, my friends, most Christian radio networks and TV stations will not carry what we have to say. Recently, I was trying to advertise an even world magazine and they would not take my ad because I was advertising this book and talking about a false Jesus and a false gospel of many of the movements today. And I mentioned Rick Warren. My friends, we are in a state with the modern church today, those of us who speak truth are ridiculed, maligned, marginalized, and called extreme. But yet, my friends, the Bible says, Jesus himself, as they persecuted you, uh, me, surely they will also persecute you. The good news is this, Romans 8, 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to compare to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Folks, we are in a spiritual battle. It's not the culture that I'm concerned about. It's not reclaiming the Congress or the White House. My friends, what I'm worried about is the church because Christ loves the church. He died for the church and we should represent Christ as we preach the gospel and defend his bride from this religious Trojan horse. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who are in Denver tonight and who are watching all across the world through the wonderful technology of the internet. And Lord, we know it can be used for evil, but we also know that it can be used for wonderful proclamation of your word to encourage and equip the saints. And so Lord, I thank you for those who are in that ballroom tonight in Denver, and yet those who are watching all across the world tonight, the remnant, your church, who wants to guard the flock from men who have risen from within. May we tonight with this fast presentation, this bird's eye view, have at least gotten a taste for what is coming to us and what's here, what's only to increase. And may we be driven closer to you into studying of your word and to understand your word gives us everything we need to be involved in this spiritual battle and defense of the gospel, the gospel that's now been made into a modern gospel to appeal to the sinful flesh of man. Lord, I thank you for men like Bill Perkins, who love the church, who love you, who love the gospel, who work long hours. Uh, he and his lovely wife, who spend countless hours when they could be spending that time working in the corporate world, but they're working for you. 
because they love the church, they love the gospel, and they want to equip people to take this truth back to their church and to encourage your bride that we might get out the gospel until that glorious day that we hear the trump sound and we're called up and caught up to be with you forever and ever. Where we give you all the honor and glory. It's your holy name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. This has been the unmasking of the One World Government Agenda, presented by Brandon Howes. To receive a free catalog of over 250 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 24 hours a day, or visit us on the web at compass.org.